So you've joined Modern Front End Engineering. My name's Dustin Whittle. Uh, you can find out a bit about me at DustinWhittle.com, or you can follow me on Twitter at Dustin Whittle. I am from San Francisco, California. It's a pleasure to be here. So a lot of this uh, talk comes from my experience building web applications over the last decade. Um, I started in basically 2005. Um, I'm currently a developer evangelist at a company called AppDynamics that focuses on application performance. Before that, I was CTO at a startup called Quarter. I uh, did a bunch of consulting and training for Sensio Labs, brought a PHP framework called Symphony to Yahoo, built delicious Yahoo Answers, a bunch of properties. And then uh, I started with phpfreaks.com, Linux Forum, and a bunch of other random sites. So I've done a bunch of uh, different web applications over the past decade. And the reality is that the complexity has really exploded over the last five years. Um, when I started, there was no really great frameworks, especially on the front end. There was a bunch on the server side, but they were all pretty uh, antiquated. So the reality is the application complexity is exploding, uh, both on the server side and the back end tiers with uh, microservices and sort of service oriented architecture. You basically have a bunch of services living in containers talking over HTTP or protocol buffers or Thrift or whatever you're using. And then you have a bunch more on the front end. So you have not only do you have uh, Chrome and Internet Explorer, Opera, Firefox on the desktop, you also have the mobile devices to worry about. And then the mobile, uh, the device fragmentation in the mobile market is even worse than the desktop market. So how do you build great front end experiences that work across all these different services and all these different devices? And that's really what the heart of this talk is about. And I like to pretend I'm an old man, but you kids have it easy. And let me explain why. Because a lot of the tools, a lot of the foundation that you have there today didn't exist when I got started. So you had to figure everything out by scratch. You had to figure out all the browser quirks. You really had to build out all the tools. And nowadays, it's much easier because you have a lot of bootstrapping tools. So you no longer have to write the boilerplate code. You can use generators to generate a default project with best practices built in. There's a bunch of UI frameworks that make it extremely easy to build uh, UI components. And then you have integration between your server-side frameworks. So if you want to use Angular with Spring, it's pretty easy to do now. So let's take a look at some of these. So first, we'll start with HTML5 boilerplate. So a bunch of front-end engineers collaborate on an open source project that makes it very easy to build a modern front-end template for a modern web application. So if you haven't heard of HTML5 boilerplate, check it out, html5boilerplate.com. And the idea here is it allows you to build a simple HTML application that uses best practices uh, to structure your application. So a lot of the tools I'm going to be talking about, I know I'm talking at a Java conference, but a lot of the front end tools are really written in Node.js. So if you're not familiar, uh, you, a lot of these tools are going to be based on Node.js and NPM. Um, check it out, Node.js.com, and then NPM. So NPM is a node package manager, very similar to something like Maven or Gradle or any one of these tools that you might use, uh, built, for, uh, built for the Node.js community. And the reason I mentioned Node.js and I talk about NPM is because a lot of the dependencies we're going to be talking about are built on this as a foundation. And a lot of what I like to talk about is how to automate your front end workflows. I think most people have gone, have built through, built enough apps where you understand that there's a lot of common patterns. And the more that you can automate, the more you can focus on what makes your app special instead of all the tedious boilerplate. And that's really what's changed a lot. You no longer have to focus on all the minor details. You can focus on what makes an app special uh, and not on the boilerplate. So automate your front-end workflows. So what does the development lifecycle look like? You generally can bootstrap an app, with, especially with Spring Boot. It makes it really easy to bootstrap on the server side. And then you have a bunch of front-end UI toolkits like Angular, Ember, React. They make it easy to bootstrap an application on the client side. But generally, you start with some level of scaffolding. And then you have a bunch of dependencies that you manage. So you have some sort of dependency manager. You might use Maven. Um, on the client side, you might use Bower, or NPM, JS. And then you have your development workflow. So you might write some JavaScript, CSS, build out a UI component in HTML, and then you need to wire up some actions. And then you iterate on that, and you need to test it, and then you rinse and repeat. And you constantly are building this. And then at that time, once you've done the development portion, you really want to package it for production. And oftentimes, you need to concatenate and minify your CSS and JavaScript, optimize your HTML, and do a bunch of things to make your application production ready. And the server side, this might mean turning on caching, um, and setting up error logging and this sort of thing. But on the client side, it means really optimizing for performance. So all these tools really uh, are built to optimize this workflow, to automate this workflow. So we'll get started with something pretty straightforward called Grunt. Grunt is a JavaScript task runner. So everyone in the Java world is pretty familiar with Maven. It's a way to run a series of tasks or builds. Uh, most people use it for building your applications and managing your dependencies. 
Well, Grunt allows you to do the same thing, but in the JavaScript world. So it's, it's written in Node.js, and the reason I mention it is it's what you use to optimize and build your, your web application on the front end. So there's Grunt. It's pretty easy to install. If you've installed Node.js and NPM, you can simply install npm grunt-cli. And once you have the Grunt command line installed, you can pretty much install any of the plugins in the community. And the reason I mention this is because a lot of the tools like minifying CSS and JavaScript, optimizing your HTML, are all written uh, in Node.js and exposed either via a Grunt plugin or a Gulp plugin. So Grunt has a very large community of these plugins, and it makes it very easy to anything that you want to automate on the front end. You usually don't have to write. You can just search for it, much like you'd find a package on GitHub. So we'll walk through a couple examples in a bit. Um, the competitor to Grunt or, uh, is Gulp. And again, it serves the same function, which is to automate front-end workflows. And to, uh, it's a build system written in Node.js, or task manager, or task runner written in Node.js. Again, it's just as easy to install npm install gulp. So pick your flavor. Um, again, they have a very large community. So if you want to uh, convert ES5 JavaScript to ES6, it's pretty easy to do, uh, or reverse for that. So there's a, many plugins with both of these communities, both with Grunt and Gulp, which regardless of which build system you use or which task runner you use, they all have plugins for optimizing performance, for packaging your applications, and for automating your front end workflows. Now, a lot of times people ask why Grunt or Gulp, but basically Grunt and Gulp make it easy to incorporate best practices and automate the tedious parts of web development. So a lot of what I'm talking about are tools and automation, and then we'll dive into some of the frameworks and talk about how do you apply the MVC model to the client side. So Grunt versus Gulp really doesn't matter. Pick your flavor. There's a large community that support both. I personally prefer Gulp because I prefer code over configuration. In Gulp, you essentially define a pipeline, and uh, Grunt, you basically configure plugins and uh, series that they get executed. We'll dive into some ex actual code examples in a few minutes. Now, I mentioned all of those so that I can talk about this. Uh, Bower is a package manager for the web, so if you've ever included jQuery in a project, uh, you have to keep it up to date. If you've ever included Angular or any other JavaScript dependency in your project, you have to manage your dependencies in the versions. So Bower makes it very easy to do this for the client side. So again, Bower is written in Node.js. It allows you to manage JavaScript dependencies. So I want to have jQuery 1.2. I want to have Angular 1.4. And if there's any, ever a upgrade in one of those vendor packages, you can just run Bower update and get the latest version of that package. All these packages have dependencies and constraints around that, and Bower enforces those constraints, so you're not going to include the latest version of jQuery if it's not compatible with the latest version of Angular, or vice versa. OK, so Bower is pretty straightforward to install. npm install Bower. So we've talked about a couple of things. We've talked about a task runner, so Grunt and Gulp, npm install Grunt or Gulp, and then uh, basically a browser package manager, so Bower. Pretty easy to install with npm install Bower. Once you have installed Bower, you can create a new project by calling Bower init. Basically, it just describes your dependencies in a project. It's a simple JSON file, and it looks like this. So when you call Bower init, it'll basically build out just this JavaScript file. And what you can define are your dependencies. The only thing I'm actually including here is jQuery. So I just want to include, include jQuery 2 in my project. And what this will do is it'll allow me to use the Bower command to Bower install my jQuery, and if I want to update it at a later point, I can call Bower update. Um, there's a bunch of other things in here, but the main idea is that uh, I have my main application file. In this case, it's just app.js. I have a way to describe the package. If I want to publish this as a package to the Bower repository, I can give it a name. In this case, it's just a demo app with a name called app. Give it a version, give it a list of authors, and some basic licensing information. But the really important part here is to list the dependencies and the versions. The idea here is that Bower allows you to manage client-side dependencies and hard-code your versions pretty easily. So the basic usage of Bower is pretty straightforward. You can Bower search for dependencies. So if I want to find all the Angular UI packages, I can Bower search Angular UI and get a list of packages. If I want to install a new dependency into my project, like Angular, I can just simply call Bower, ins Bower install Angular and it'll add it to my uh, package JSON. And if I want to list the current dependencies, Bower list. All pretty straightforward. And then again, oftentimes the problem with managing dependencies is vendors go and release a new version, and you have to stay up to date and upgrade all the dependencies of that dependency, and that can become quite tedious. Uh, again, run Bower update, and you're good to go. Now, there's another JavaScript package manager called JSPM. 
Um, the idea here is it allows you to use the ES6 module loader format. I'm not sure how many of you uh, have in-depth JavaScript knowledge, but basically it's the next level, uh, it's the next standard for JavaScript, uh, ECMAScript 6. Uh, and it allows you to use any module format. So Bower makes it easy to manage front-end dependencies where JSPM is a more complete solution that allows you to manage not only on the client side but also on the server side. Okay. Now again, I mentioned all those tools so that I could talk about Yeoman. Yeoman builds together all these tools to allow you to basically generate scaffolding for a net new project. If you're getting started today with front-end development and you haven't done it before, you should start with scaffolding that has best practices and the good examples built in by default. So Yeoman is the web scaffolding tools for modern web apps. And again, you can install it with npm install yo. Yo. Okay, now the idea here is that Yo allows you to, again, build scaffolding. So in much the way Spring Boot gives you a, a default Spring application following best practices, uh, this allows you to do the same thing but in the front end world. So if you wanna understand how you should structure HTML, how you should uh, structure Grunt and Gulp files, this makes it really easy to do. So it uses a build system, Grunt or Gulp, it's really your preference, um, and then using a package manager like Bower to basically set up the, the uh, dependencies for your application. So we'll go through a real example right now. So in order to get started, I've tried to make all these slides pretty obvious so that you can follow along later. I'm gonna cover a lot of content today, not all of it super in depth, so I've tried to make it so you can download the slides which are available on speakerdeck.com uh, uh, so you can follow them uh, after the talk. So npm install yo, bower, grunt, and gulp, and then you can run uh, the generator. So Yo comes with a series of generators, but you can have a generator for any different project. Maybe you're not using Spring, maybe you don't want to use Angular, you want to use React and React UI or ReApp, um, or you want to use Angular and your own flavor. There's a bunch of different generators that are available. It makes it very easy to create your own packages and create your own custom uh, scaffolding. But we'll go through the basic one, which is the web app generator, because it's pretty straightforward. So you can npm install the generator web app, and then you can call Yo web app. So let's do that. Can everyone read this? Yo, web app. Hopefully that's legible. All right, so the idea here is we wanna generate a new web, app, web project, so we're just gonna give it some options. By default, this generator uses uh, uh, Twitter Bootstrap, uses SAS for CSS, and uses Modernizer and HTML5 boilerplate. And I'll, we'll walk through the code in just a second, but you can customize it. So in this case, I wanna use SAS, I wanna use Bootstrap, and I wanna use Modernizer. So it's going to create some, a default package structure. In this case, it's going to create a bower.json file to, to specify my bower dependencies, a package.json file to specify my Node.js dependencies or NPM dependencies, and this project is going to use Grunt. So Grunt is, again, a task runner, and it's just going to build a set of default tasks and a default Grunt configuration so that it packages your application up in an optimized way. So it'll give you tasks that will automatically minify into your CSS and JavaScript, concatenate it all, and then optimize your HTML. And it gives you a default Grunt file that specifies all of that. And then it gives you a basic uh, JavaScript file, a main application JavaScript file, an index.html template, which is based on the HTML5 boilerplate template, and then it will set up a uh, main.css file. And what you see here is it's running through the npm install of all of the dependencies. So we're using some tools to optimize our images, we're using some tools to optimize our CSS and optimize our JavaScript, and this is installing all of those dependencies. And then the other thing it's doing is installing a test framework. So the, in the same way that you write functional tests on the server side, you should write functional tests on the client side. When you build a UI component, you know that when the page loads that you want this input field to automatically have focus. And then when I type something into that input field, I want to make sure I, when I submit it, this interaction happens. So most people don't really do much testing in JavaScript these days, which is quite sad because they have an emphasis on doing it on the server side. Uh, but the client side is just as important. So this gives you a default structure for doing that as well. And then we'll take a look at this project. So we can actually walk through this. I think this is probably not readable, but let's see if we can zoom in. Okay, so this gives us a demo application project. It gives us a app directory for the basic structure of our application. Um, it sets up our Bower components. So when you run Bower install, Bower creates the Bower components directory and it puts all of your JavaScript in here. So we depend on jQuery and in this case, Modernizer and a couple of other things. 
And then it gives you your grunt file. All right, let's walk through each one of these. So this is our Bower JSON file. Uh, what we want to use is we, this project has some dependencies on uh, the Twitter Bootstrap framework, which is a CSS framework and JavaScript framework, and then also Modernizer, which is an HTML5 shim, so that you can take advantage of the latest features in uh, almost all browsers. So we just have a couple of dependencies. We want to include the bootstrap SAS and the Modernizer file. So this project has been bootstrapped, and now we have our Bower JSON with our two dependencies listed. And then because we, uh, when Yo bootstrapped the project, it ran npm install, so it installed all of our package dependencies. And then the next one's our grunt file. So let's go back to our project and run grunt. So let's take a look at some of the tasks just because we're gonna walk through a couple of these. So one, we wanna lint all of our JavaScript files. Like, do the JavaScript files have any parse errors? If so, we should be catching that at build time rather than releasing with that. So let's just lint all the JavaScript files. Uh, let's, we want to run Babel so we can take advantage of ECMAScript 5 or ECMAScript 6 today. And then we wanna run some of our tests. We want to uh, post-process all of our CSS so it's optimized. We're only using, we only include the CSS in production that we're actually using, and then we're gonna run our test. So what this looks like is this. And then it'll bootstrap a simple server to show you the page. Ah. So this is our generator web app, pretty straightforward. It's built on HTML5 boilerplate, uses SAS for CSS, bootstrap for the UI framework, and modernizer for HTML5 shim. Pretty straightforward. If you look at the source code, it's all optimized. So in this build, this is the development build since I just ran grunt serve, but if I did a grunt build, it'll build out a disk directory and What you'll see is in this index.html, this is the build file. So when you call grunt, it's gonna run through these series of tasks, it's gonna optimize your application, and it's gonna build it out into the disk directory. And what we're gonna look at is the index.html of this optimized application. So in this case, you can see all the spacing's been removed. Uh, it's been minified. We have one CSS file, one JavaScript file. So we're following some modern front end best practices. Okay. Okay, so when, uh, in order to do that, you need to configure Grunt. Grunt just runs a series of tasks. When we installed all these dependencies, Grunt set up a series of tasks in it and created this Grunt file.js. So this, that's what we're looking at right now is the Grunt file. And all Grunt file defines is a, a list of uh, configuration for the tasks that we wanna run. So in this case, we have an app called app and we wanna put things in the disk directory when, when they finish building. And we're gonna include some of our tasks. So in this case, uh, we include Bower, so we wanna uh, watch all of these files. So one of the nice things about this, pack, this setup is if you do a lot of front-end development, one of the tedious things is having to save a file, rerun a build command, and refresh in your browser. So there's a grunt task that allows you to watch any file, so watch your CSS or JavaScript, and when it changes, it'll automatically fire off the build. So you can just edit your files and refresh in the browser in real time. And then there's browser sync, which allows you to test across multiple devices and keep, your, keep the state of those devices um, in sync. So if I want to test something in Chrome and Firefox, I can do the interaction in one browser and have it sync across all the different browsers. So the idea here is that we're gonna go and configure each one of these plugins, and we're gonna define each one of the build steps. So in this case, we want to uh, clean our temp directory, we want to run our lint file. In this case, we're gonna lint these files so anything in the scripts JavaScript directory or in the scripts vendors directory. Uh, we wanna run, we're using Mocha for building a test kit. We'll walk through that a little bit later. Um, we're gonna run Babel, so Babel translates JavaScript to, to so tomorrow's JavaScript so that you can use it today. So you can use ECMAScript 6 and it'll convert it to ECMAScript 5. Uh, and then it's gonna compile all of our SAS files. So I'll go through some more examples a bit later, but the idea here is it's gonna configure all of your tasks and uh, when you run Grunt, it's gonna run through each one of these tasks. And then if we take a look at our index.html, this is the HTML5 boilerplate that has some comments built in. So these tasks are gonna get run by Grunt and it's gonna build out all these files so that you have one CSS file. So you can group your series of CSS and you can group your set of JavaScript to get minified in production. Uh, you annotate them with some comments here. So we'll dive in uh, a little bit more, but the idea here is that this HTML5 layout 
will work in all modern browsers, and you don't have to really worry about the browser quirks if you get started with this. If you use this in combination with something like Twitter's Bootstrap, it makes it very easy to start building UI components that work across all the modern browsers without having to focus on the browser quirks. All right. So with you, man, it's, the idea here, again, is that it's very easy to build scaffolding for a new application that has best practices built in, that automatically configures a JavaScript task runner like Grunt or Gulp, that automatically gives you a test framework, and uh, effectively gives you best practices by default. Now, I ran, ran through pretty much all of this uh, manually, but just for clarity, you call Yo Web App, and you can use Yo with any generator that you want. It'll configure uh, your set of tasks. It'll consider, configure the generator to build whatever scaffolding you'd like. Then if you want to install some dependencies, like I want to install jQuery PJAX, I can just power install a new JavaScript dependency. And then I can call Grunt, and it'll run uh, an update to my application, where it'll package everything again, download the latest dependencies, and then run any test. Whether you're using Grunt or whether you're using Gulp, it's basically the same idea. Uh, underneath, you can run Grunt Serve. It'll generate your application. That's how I was able to just uh, quickly live preview this app, is just by calling uh, Grunt Serve, which will spin up a, J a web server in Node.js, so you can very quickly view what it looks like in the browser. And then if I want to run my test, I can call grunt test, and it'll run Mocha test. It'll run test using Mocha. So we'll dive into how each one of these work in a bit. Uh, and then it's the same format with Gulp. So grunt and Gulp, uh, while the underlying framework is very different, uh, how you actually use the commands are pretty straightforward, but it depends on the test you're using. Grunt serve, grunt, uh, gulp serve, gulp test, grunt, uh, Grunt test, pretty straightforward. Now let's talk a little bit about frameworks because I think that's probably what most people came here to, to find out about. Um, I like to use examples that everyone can follow after the fact, so everything I'm gonna be talking about today is available open source on the internet so you can use it. So, so Todo MVC is a great tool for learning new JavaScript frameworks. I think the to-do list is the new hello world if you're trying to understand how to use an application framework. Uh, it's a real example because it allows you to add something to a list. It has a, a model component, a view component, component, and a controller component. And we'll take a look at what this looks like. I'll start with a jQuery example because I think most people have probably written some level of jQuery or written JavaScript without a framework and struggled with it. And then we'll look at how you can uh, move to an MVC model. So to do MVC has been called uh, the speed dating of JavaScript frameworks or the Rosetta Stone of JavaScript frameworks. To do MVC.com. The reason I like it is it gives you a very easy way to see how each framework compares, and it's the exact same implementation in terms of functionality, but in every framework you can think of. So I picked three examples. Uh, in this case, we're going to be talking about React as a UI toolkit from uh, Facebook, Ember.js, and Angular UI from Google, and a bunch of other people. Um, all of these examples are available on to do MVC.com. So to get started, and this is what I'm going to show in code, is this repository. So you can just git clone to do MVC. OK, so by a show of hands, how many of you have used jQuery? Everybody, because jQuery is the backbone of the internet, something like that. So the idea here is we have a to-do list. If we go to to do MVC, you can go find the jQuery example, and we can see what a to-do list might look like. As you imagine, it looks like a to-do list. You can add items to the list. You can mark them as complete. Check, built the slides, present it to an audience, and I'll do this one later. I can filter the view. So if I only want to show the things that are done uh, left to do, I can show you what's active, show you what's been completed. I can show you all of them. If I want to select all of them, I can. If I want to select none of them, I can. So there's some basic functionality. But the idea here is that there's a view component. So each one, there's a to-do collection. Inside of this to-do collection, there's a to-do item. For each one of these is an item. And then I can have actions on each one of these items. Like I can select it. I can select all of the items in the collection. And then I can do something with them. Like I want to mark them as completed or not done. So this is a pretty good example because it makes it very easy to have a concrete example to, that you can map across multiple frameworks. So let's show this example, which is written in jQuery. So this is a frameworkless example, and then we'll dive into the rest. So in jQuery, I have app.js. That's it. 
So we're gonna, in this case, it's jQuery and it uses handlebars for the templating, but you could write the template, the HTML as just raw HTML fragments and it would work the same. Uh, I think this is a little bit hard to read, but we'll go through here. So again, we have certain actions that we wanna take, we have certain views that we wanna build, and then we have controller state that we wanna manage. In this case, we're gonna bootstrap our application. When you're not using a framework, you have to do all of this manually. So I have to wire up all the JavaScript events, I have to build out all the HTML fragments, and then I have to um, do some things to optimize performance. So in this case, we're gonna build out the to-do list. We're gonna create a router, which we'll get into a little bit later, but the idea here is that I need to create a list of elements that I want to access later. So in this case, I have my to-do app with a container div. Inside of that, I have a header, I have my main application, I have a footer, I have an element to toggle all of the selecting all versus selecting none, and then I have my actual to-do list items, and then I have a count of the total number of items and the count of the ones that are completed. So each one of these is an element. So we're just gonna cache the lookup to each one of these. So all we're gonna do is find it a div by its ID. And then we wanna bind events. So when I click on a new to-do list, I have a new to-do list action, and I, fi I create a new view from that. And then when I uh, click on a button in this case, I want to toggle the state of this element so I want to apply some new CSS and I want to toggle the state so it's marked as completed. And I might also want to make a call to the back end to actually say, hey, this is a post to this to-do item and I want to set the status to completed. So in the jQuery world, you have to do all of this very manually and it's very much a pain. Um, so you have to render all of this so you'll build the cell. And then for each one of these, you, each one of the controller actions, if you will, I want to toggle all. So I want to find all the boxes, all the input fields that are checked, and if they're not checked, I want to check them. If they are checked, I want to uncheck them. So this JavaScript effectively does that. So show me all the elements where the property is checked, and then for each one of those, I want to mark completed uh, as to true or false. And then if I want to get the list of active to-do items, I want to find the same thing where the property is not completed. And then when I want to filter based on these, depending on the filter, whether it's active or completed, I want to filter. So for each one of these actions, so I have active, I have completed. I have to manually code all of this logic. And then for each one of these items, I want to delete an item, I want to add a new item. So the basic to-do list functionality, right? But implemented in raw JavaScript. And then when you create an item, I basically want to create a new input value. When I hit enter, I need to wire up the key press for the enter key, and then I want to add it to my list of to-do items. So it has three values, a unique ID for the to-do list, a title, which is the whatever I typed into this input box, and whether it's completed or not. By default, it's not completed, so we're gonna set completed false. And then I want to set a new value, so I wanna reset this value back to being empty once I've typed something in there. So I'm gonna reset the value, and then I'm gonna render the whole widget again. So all of this is very tedious, and, and much the same that uh, the, con the conventions of having a framework like Spring where you have models and a repository for looking up uh, your models, where you have controllers that have actions for interacting with that, and you have a view layer where the controllers tie the views together. Um, you wanna have the same thing on the client side because you follow the same conventions. It's just you don't, you, usually people don't think of it that way. So there's a bunch more functionality. We don't need to walk through it all. The idea here is that in jQuery, it's very tedious. You have to wire up all the elements yourself. You have to wire up all the events yourself, and then you have to manually write all the functionality. But if you really look at how you'd implement this in uh, an MVC framework, I would have a model, which is a to-do item. Inside that to-do item, I would have an ID, I would have a name, and whether it's completed or not. And then I might have a CRUD generator that generates some uh, create, read, update, delete views that allows me to quickly and easily uh, have JSON endpoints for that functionality. Well, you can do the same thing in the JavaScript MVC world. So let's take a look at another example built on Angular. And what you'll see is a lot of the boilerplate by using the conventions of the framework, uh, you get rid of a lot of the boilerplate. So wiring up the events, building out the views and rendering these components becomes much easier. So Angular 2 was just released. Sadly, this is all written in Angular 1, but uh, give me a couple weeks and I'll update it. So again, to do MVC, it's gonna be the exact same example, the exact same app. If you're curious how we get here, to do MVC.com. Angular, and then it's the exact same app. So hello, one, two, three. I can filter based on active, filter based on completed. I can add items, I can remove items. 
exact same functionality. I have a count of the total number of items, and I can clear the ones that have been completed. So let's take a look at what the code would look like for this. So here we have our application JS. In this case, it also provides a router component. So oftentimes, when you're dealing with single page applications, you need to maintain the state of that application so you can get back there later, and so that you can have the uh, backwards and forwards functionality that most people are used to in the browser. So there's a router component that allows you to see a particular to-do item, um, and in this case, we're just gonna render the to-do mvc uh, index.html. So let's take a look at our index.html. This is pretty much the same thing that we have here, except for what you'll notice is that we've built a ng app. So in this case, we have an Angular application called to-do mvc, and we've created a new view. And then inside of this, we have our to-do list. So what you'll notice is that you attach the events by using the HTML structure. So in this case, I want to say, um, in this case, I want to repeat for each to-do in the, for each to-do item in the list of uh, to-dos, I want to create a new view. So I want to create a new element, input element, and then I want to attach some events to that. So when I change this, I want to trigger this action. So when I click on the checkbox, in this case, what you'll see is each one of these represents an Angular view. And in this case, we have a view that consists of an input box. So that's this checkbox here. And when I click on this checkbox, I want to mark that item as completed. So here, I, when I have a type checkbox, it's bound to the to-do completed model. And when I click on that button, I want to change the state of that by toggling the complete on the to-do item. So we'll walk through some of the code in just a second. But what you'll see is that you're managing a lot more of this in HTML on the client side than you are in just JavaScript. So when you're looking at the functionality as it's declared in HTML, it's very much easy to understand the directives. And then we'll go back to our app.js. So all we do here is configure our router, and then we'll take a look at some storage services and our controller. So this is for the Angular module to-do. Pretty straightforward. This is our, con our to-do controller. And the idea here is that we want to very quickly create a list of to-dos and then be able to edit each one. So in this case, we want to watch the list elements to-dos. So we define that in our HTML block here. So we have our list of to-dos here. To-dos based on the to-do model. So we have to-do length. So in this case, uh, this is the same. I want to count the number of items in this list. And then for each one, I want to show a checkbox. When I click on that checkbox, I want to mark that to-do as completed. And I want to wire up some actions. So the idea here is always the same, which is I want to bind an event for some functionality. And uh, then I want to code in that functionality. So that's managed by the controller. So for each one of these, I want to add a to-do. In this case, we're going to have an add to-do method that effectively does what we did in jQuery earlier. So when I add a new element, aka when I click on this new item and I type here, I want something to happen. And what I want to do is I want to create a new to-do model. And this to-do model, I want to trim the title, which is the value of that text. And I want to set completed as false. If there's nothing in the title, I want to do nothing because there's nothing to type in. Otherwise, I want to insert into the store. So in this case, the new to-do is empty, and then finally we can save it. So the idea here is that for each one of these, and I don't, how are we doing on that? Yeah. So for each one of these, uh, it's pretty straightforward to map the, the conventions you use on the server side, like having a model where a model has related objects, uh, where a model has properties, and then you have a controller, where a controller takes actions on a model and does something with a view. So. You can go through many of these. Um, Angular, Ember, React, they all have their own flavor. There's a bunch of different, uh, there's a bunch of nuances. Pick the one that's best for you. Um, we can go through the same example inside of Ember. Again, it's a to-do MVC example, so we'll walk through that code live as well. So to-do MVC, search for Ember, and you have the same functionality. All right, so the same idea. This one's a bit easy, straight, more straightforward because you have a concrete model uh, view that's a handlebars view and an actual controller. So let's just dive into that. So here we have our app.js. In this case, we're just gonna create a new Ember application that's as easy as calling Ember application.create. So now I have a to-do app. Uh, and then I, if I want to have a storage component to this, like I wanna persist these to-do items to a server-side component, 
Uh, there's Ember Data, which allows you to interact. So in this case, we're just going to create um, a data store adapter, and this one's going to be uh, in the page itself. So there is no server side component to this. And then we're going to create a model. So a model is just as straightforward as it would be in Java. I have a to-do model. It's going to extend the data store model, and it's going to have a title, which is a string, and is completed, which is Boolean, so true, false. And then I have a series of controllers. So if we take a look at our index.html page, so this is going to use a, uh, handlebars for the, the templating piece. So if we start with the template, uh, what we have is if I have more than one item, I want to create an item. If I can toggle, I want to create an input type checkbox where I can toggle all the items. And then I create a to-do list. And inside of this to-do list, for each one of the to-do items from the data store, I want to print out a new field. So it's the same pattern again and again. The idea here is if I'm editing the current view, I want to be able to create an input box that I can edit. So by default, I'm not editing this. But as soon as I click on this element, I actually want to convert this to a input text box. And then I can change it. And once I change something and I click Enter, I want to save it. So how do we wire that idea up? How do, you, how do you control that? So if I'm editing, and we'll define what editing is in just a second, I want to show an input box. Otherwise, I just want to show a checkbox and a label with the value of the to-do item. And I want to do that in just a, for each loop, so for each item in the to-do list. And then we have our to-do app. So this is the to-do app that renders the entire page. So what you'll see is this is the to-do list. So this is a template for each to-do item. And then you have a wrapper for the entire application, which has a header. In the header, I want to list the, whether I want a button to add a new field. Uh, in this case, it's just an input to create a new to-do item. And when I fill in that input, I want to fire the action create to-do. And I have some placeholder text. So some placeholder text, what needs to be done. When I click in there, I type something. I want to add a new item. And then I have the actual to-do list itself that we render. And then I have the footer, which is just a count of the number of items in the list. And then I have some filters. So I want to show all the active ones. I want to show all the completed ones. And if the completed length is done, if there's uh, many, then I can say clear completed, which is this functionality here. So again, we have the model portion, which is very straightforward. So let's recap. We have an application. We create our application, Ember application create. We create our model. In this case, we have a to-do JavaScript. So if you're looking at the structure for this application, you have controllers, helpers, models, and views. And then you have your application JavaScript. And then if you have a router component, you have a router JS that defines how the routes map to these actions. So we talked about the application. We talked about the model. We talked through the to-do controller. So or sorry, we talked through the template itself. Um, now we want to actually add actions to this. So we have a controller, and we want to wire each one of these actions. So the actions that I can have on a to-do list, in this case, I have a to-do controller, which is an Ember object controller that we want to extend. I can add edit a to-do list. So when I edit it, I just want to set the state to is editing. That's what allows you to use the functionality here. So if is editing, so if the state, if I'm, edit, if I'm currently trying to edit this object, I want to use this handlebars view versus uh, the list view. And then once I'm done editing, I want to trim the value of the, what I typed in. If it's not empty, um, I want to uh, set a new to-do list. So I'll create a new to-do model. I'll set the title, and then I'll save the item. And then I'll re-render the view. Um, and then for each one of these actions, it's basically the same thing. I can cancel and edit by clicking the X button. I can remove a to-do list by clicking X. And if I do, it'll map to each one of these. So if I want to remove an item, I'm going to get the model. I'm just going to delete the current record that's selected. And then I'll save the list. So you can walk through the same thing in every one of these examples. But the, the general idea is that uh, on the client side, you, you treat it the same way as you would on the server side, which is model views and controllers. And each framework has their nuances. So in Angular, you do a lot more inside uh, using directives. Um, and you do a lot more inside of the HTML itself. In Ember, you're going to do everything in the, on the JavaScript side and use handlebars to, control the, uh, to build out your views and to control the state. Um, and then React, again, is also the same. So uh, it's a little bit different. And I'll sort of walk through these in just a second. But let's walk through the React example. 
Again, I try to make all these so that you can follow them later and start from scratch. So to do mdc.com will be your friend. These are directly copied from there. But the idea here is I have an application JavaScript. So this is in React. Um, the idea here is I have a to-do model. Pretty straightforward. I have a to-do model, has a list of to-dos, and on change I want to do something. Um, so in this case, this controls the state of each one of these, but the idea here is when I add a to-do, I want to create a to-do list item that has an ID, a title, and completed, just like we had in the Ember model world. And then I want to add state to each one of these. So I want to toggle all the interactions. So again, to-do in VC, React, the same functionality. We can walk through as many of these examples for every one of these frameworks. But the idea here is how do you implement each one of these in each framework? Uh, and they all have their nuances. It's a lot more than can be explained in a single talk. Like, you yeah, can do an hour on each one of these frameworks. Um, but if you want to get started with modern front end engineering, the reason I mention all these is these are the three popular ones, I think, from the community. Um, and they are quite good, at, and they're all good at their, their own things. Um, I don't want to start a war here on which one's the best. My personal favorite is Ember. That's why I'm way more confident talking about Ember. Um, I've used it a lot more than the past. Now, uh, how many of you are Java, Java hipsters? There's a couple of you out there. Uh, so the idea here is jhipster basically uses Yeoman, and if you're really starting a new project with Spring and you want to follow best practices and you want to use Angular for the UI toolkit, uh, jhipster is a Yeoman generator that uses Spring Boot and a bunch of best practices so that you have a modern application structure by default. So if you're getting started with something brand new today and you don't mind using Angular, I highly recommend taking a look at uh, jhipster. So I think it's jhipster.io. Uh, but the idea, the idea here is it uses HTML5 boilerplate, it uses Twitter Bootstrap, AngularJS, um, it uses Angular templates, it uses SAS for CSS, and it uses Yeoman to generate that workflow that we talked about earlier. So it'll use Bower and uh, Gulp, and then it can use Karma. But more importantly, it also integrates with uh, the Spring stack. So it's going to use Spring Boot uh, and a bunch of Spring components to automate this. The idea here is that you have, if you have a single page application and you want to do everything in Angular and using MVC on the client side in a single page application and use Spring to provide a set of JSON endpoints that you talk to via JavaScript, this is a great way to get your project started. It has support for localization and sort of all the enterprise features that you would expect in a modern application. So uh, I'll quickly run through uh, jhipster sample app, but uh, github.com slash jhipster and jhipster sample app. So you can simply, somewhere in here there's an example. There we go. Uh, I've already run Maven, but otherwise I'd run Maven. It would build, download all the packages, which will take forever, so I'm not going to do it on stage. And then you can run Grunt, and you'll have your application ready to go. Mm. So I'll quickly run through just what this looks like and how it interacts. It basically has JSON endpoints for managing user login, uh, user authentication, and localization. And then it glues everything together in the JavaScript world using Angular. It's going to take a second. All right. So the reason I mentioned this is this is obviously a spring event, and uh, you know, I, want to talk, I wanted to talk about modern front engineering, and this is the best of both worlds. It allows you to very easily bootstrap a, new, a brand new project using best practices, and it gives you a working example to, on how to do some of the stuff I was talking about earlier with spring directly. So what you'll notice is that these aren't new pages. These are just different actions. So if I want to authenticate, what you'll notice is it's using the Angular router to create a new view. It has an, a login view, effectively. I can log in with some credentials. I can switch languages, so it has support for localization. Uh, so it'll show you how to manage routing, show you how to build views with Angular UI, and it'll show you how to interact with Spring via JSON endpoint to actually log in, log out, save state. So if you're getting started, I'd highly recommend taking a look at jhipster. OK. So there's a lot of other tools out there. There's a lot of uh, new languages. Sometimes uh, the languages that currently exist are not that great or have a bunch of shortcomings. So uh, CoffeeScript is a way to write JavaScript that's a little bit cleaner. Um, take a look at it if that's more your flavor. But the idea here is it looks a little bit 
more logical. So you can see, I think that works. Yeah. So you'd normally have to write, uh, it's just a much shorter way of writing uh, JavaScript and much cleaner, but the problem is it's not native, so you need to convert to JavaScript, and that's effectively what CoffeeScript does. It allows you to write CoffeeScript and then run a CoffeeScript processor that converts it to JavaScript. If you're using Angular 2, which if you're going to take a look at Angular, Angular 2 is the way to go, then you're going to be using TypeScript. So TypeScript lets you write JavaScript the way you really want to, has support for the idea of like real objects and uh, inheritance and all this sort of stuff that JavaScript doesn't really support out of the box, um, at least the way it works today. So take a look at TypeScript, sort of the next, gives you the latest features of JavaScript available today, and it allows you to run it anywhere. Now, there's ECMAScript 5 and ECMAScript 6. So ECMAScript 5 is basically JavaScript today as implemented in most browsers, and ECMAScript 6 is the next generation of that. You can use ECMAScript 6 today, but it needs to be converted down to ECMAScript 5 in order for it to be usable by most browsers, and Babel is basically a tool that allows you to do that. So if you want to take advantage of the latest uh, JavaScript uh, techniques, you can do that today, but you're going to need to make it available in all the browsers. So check out Babel. It allows you to transform your JavaScript so you can use tomorrow's JavaScript today. And then SAS. SAS is CSS with superpowers. So most of these tools or most of these uh, uh, superscripts of the languages are built because of various shortcomings. If you've written a lot of CSS, you realize that CSS really isn't that great. There's a lot of stuff that you, is repetitive. Um, and the, uh, SAS makes it very easy to, to fix some of that. So, SAS, again, you have to convert it down to CSS, but the idea here is it makes it very easy to write extensible CSS that doesn't have to repeat. So I can inherit properties of um, a to-do item and then extend that without repeating the code itself. And then Bootstrap. So I think probably, by show of hands, how many of you used Twitter Bootstrap in the past? Right, because it makes it very easy to build UI components without actually having to do any real work. You can copy and paste an example, and it's going to work across all the browsers. If I want to do an autocomplete list, or if I just want to have a solid CSS grid system, um, Twitter Bootstrap makes it really easy to have consistent UI across multiple browsers. When I got started, I joined Yahoo in 2006, and they had just started to release the Yahoo user interface libraries. This is the first time I really discovered CSS frameworks and JavaScript frameworks. Before that, it was jQuery, Scriptaculous, Dojo, a lot of tools that were, um, didn't really do both the CSS, solve the CSS and the JavaScript problem. Um, that was my first exposure at having a CSS grid and not having to, hey, I want to have two things that, or I want to have two columns. Uh, and I want them to be 50%, how do I do that and make it work consistently across all the browsers without actually having to battle each one of the browsers? And if you've ever worked with Internet Explorer 6, you'll realize what a battle really is. Bootstrap solves all of that. Um, Bootstrap makes it extremely easy to build components. It's both a CSS framework and CSS grid, as well as a JavaScript framework that allows you to have JavaScript UI components. So uh, I mostly like to talk about the grid because I find that that has a lot of value for people. So if I want to have 100% uh, fixed width layout uh, and I want to have two columns, it's very easy to do. But the idea here is that if you're building out a UI, uh, use a, a UI toolkit like Twitter Bootstrap or Zurb Foundation. So in this case, Zurb Foundation also does, uh, is very similar to Twitter Bootstrap. Uh, the idea here is it's uh, mobile first, it's a responsive grid but it also provides JavaScript functionality. So if you want to have an autocomplete box, if you want to use a carousel, which you shouldn't, but if you wanted to, it's all available, and it's very easy to do. Uh, again, I like to talk about the grid because it's the same problem. How do you make things look consistent across all the different browsers without having to figure out the quirks of each implementation? So in this case, I prefer Zurb uh, Foundation because it's a lighter weight and has better support for browsers. Um, especially with Bootstrap 4 coming out, it's dropping support for certain browsers, but it depends on the requirements of your application. So pick the flavor that works for you. They both do roughly the same things, they just take a slightly different approach. So the idea here is if I, uh, so just a quick example, I want to have a row. Inside of that row, I want to have a list of columns. Um, I want to have two columns on the left side. I want to have four columns on the right side. So I want to split three, three of them evenly. It's very easy to do. So the idea here, though, with Foundation is it's mobile first. Uh, so it's going to be responsive by default. If I change the size of my browser, it's going to reflect that. Uh, and the one thing I don't really mention is uh, found Zurb, Foundation, Zurb uh, Foundation for Apps, which if you're using Angular UI, basically it allows you to build uh, UI apps function, sorry, UI templates very easily. 
So in this case, uh, we'll just pick a random app design. But it'll give you a structure for building apps. So this is basically like a Trello clone, from what I can tell. Um, and the idea here is if you just want a basic functionality, like a UI layout, uh, this is very easy to make happen, right? So without having to do this, and if I want to resize it, the point I was trying to make earlier is it's responsive by default, so it'll collapse the grid down. By using a CSS framework, by building responsive by default, you don't have to deal with all the different mobile devices. You don't have to have a mobile site and a regular desktop site. It should, you should build based on a responsive web design. Okay. And then semantic UI. So uh, semantic UI takes a little bit more of a pragmatic approach where I have uh, a card, and the card has a photo. And uh, actually, let's just show you a live example. All right, so here we go. So you have elements. An element, I can have a header, a footer, et cetera. But the idea here is I have a huge header, a huge footer. Well, I shouldn't have to figure out your framework for, to, I shouldn't have to figure out what your framework calls that. I know this, is a, this should be a class header, and I want it to be huge, so I'll call class huge. If I want to make uh, text on another page huge, I can just add the class huge, and it'll make it the same. Uh, it's a horrible way to explain it. Let's try this again. Uh, breadcrumb. OK. So if you take a look at what this looks like, a breadcrumb, uh, so semantic UI is that, like the idea here is that it's semantic. It makes sense just by looking at the HTML code. In this case, I have a UI and I have a breadcrumb. And inside of that breadcrumb, I have a section. And then for each section, I want to create a divider. Well, you can read that and it understands, you can understand what that means. If you go and do the same thing in Bootstrap, you have to go and look up the Bootstrap classes for how they implement it. And it's very specific to that framework. Um, I like semantic UI, especially for building out app, uh, like single page apps, where you have a bunch of individual components because it allows you to reuse a lot of the styles. And when you're coding it, it, it uh, the more you play with it, the more natural it comes. So you don't have to go and look up the documentation. You can go directly and just uh, sort of wing it. So if I have a tab and I want to make it active, I can just add the class active. I don't have to go back to your documentation to figure out how to do that. So for all of these tools, whether it's uh, React, Angular, or Ember, they all have some sort of UI component that tries to, to tie the UI toolkits. Like, I, I want to be able to uh, have some form validation in JavaScript if I want to be able to. Um, there's a ton of different functionality that you can have. Um, Angular UI is a great toolkit uh, if you're using Angular for adding these sort of actions. So Angular UI has a bunch of uh, UI views and a structure for building an MVC app, a single page app using an MVC uh, style. But oftentimes, you want to do special functionality. Like, I, I want to manage key press. So whenever they have uh, click you know, Control S in the browser, I want that to trigger that as save. Well, I can manually wire those up, or I can use Angular UI's key press events. The same thing with React. If I want to build out uh, demo applications, it's pretty easy to build on React um, with React. So npm install React is pretty straightforward. And the idea here is they extend all of these MVC frameworks and they extend all the UI components so that you don't have to build that. If you want to build an autocomplete box, well, you can use Twitter Bootstrap. But if you're using Twitter's Bootstrap and the autocomplete widget from that, and you're also using Angular UI, and Angular UI you could build an autocomplete widget from, you really want to use the same tools underneath. Otherwise, you're going to be reproducing a lot of the functionality, um, and which I, a lot of people tend to do. So a lot of the apps are a lot more bloated than they should be because you're using Bootstrap for the CSS and JavaScript framework, and you're using the autocomplete widget because it exists there. But then you also actually have to wire up your to-do list application. And part of the to-do list could be an autocomplete widget. That implementation is going to be completely separate than the, the Bootstrap implementation. So trying to standardize on a UI toolkit can help you min minimize the code duplication. And then the same thing with React. So if you're interested in getting started with React, I highly recommend the React Starter Kit, reactstarterkit.com. It'll basically give you a to, uh, an app that's ready to go following best practices. So it's not just React. In order to use React well, you should probably use Flux for the underlying architecture. And then you want to tie in all the best practices that I mentioned earlier, like Gulp and Grunt and Bower, et cetera. And then Ember UI, the same thing. If I want an input field in Ember and I want to wire that to an action like autocomplete, I don't want to have to wire that up, especially if I'm using Bootstrap to, for an autocomplete. I want to be able to use the same thing in Ember UI. So it's not just the frameworks. There's a bunch of tools that have improved. There's a lot of front-end automation. It's uh, standard, so how should you write your JavaScript? How should uh, you test it? Uh, browser testing, how do I make sure it works consistently across all the different browsers? 
Um, if you've ever written modern applications, you've probably had to send email. If you've ever tried to make email work across every different uh, client, and Gmail and Outlook, et cetera, it's quite a pain. And then server configurations. If you're using Apache or Nginx and you want to have best practices by default, there's a bunch of tools that make this very easy. And then analytics. So we'll talk about a couple of these. So uh, JSCS, basically standard JavaScript coding style. Pretty sh you shouldn't have to argue this out with your team. Refer to this. That's what everyone, all the major frameworks use uh, to have a consistent coding style. Phantom JS, uh, it's headless browser testing. So if you ever want to actually have a real browser where you can run through user interactions. So I want to go to the page. I want to click on this element. I want to type in this form field. I want to click submit. I should see this animation. Uh, and then I should see this page load or redirect to this URL. Phantom JS makes it very easy to do, uh, to test, uh, test web applications inside a real browser. And then Karma. So uh, Angular UI uses Karma. It's basically a uh, JavaScript test runner. Uh, the idea here is that it doesn't really matter what you choose. There's Karma, uh, there's Jasmine, there's a few different task runners out there. And then there's uh, test frameworks. Uh, actually, the slide's missing, but OK. So uh, the idea here is Jasmine is just a JavaScript testing framework. And the same way you test on the server side, you should be writing functional tests on the client side. You need to run those tests across an array of browsers in order to ensure that they actually work as intended. Uh, you can combine Jasmine with PhantomJS and make that very easy to run. Check out all these tools. And then again, the people who make HTML5 boilerplate also uh, have some optimized server configurations. So there's a lot of common best practices when it comes to front-end engineering, like concatenating all your CSS together and then minifying it. Um, and then you should serve that minified CSS over a gzip compressed connection. And you should serve that using the latest protocols, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all these tools that really require configuration at the server level. And instead of you having to hash that out or figure out, figure out what's the best SSL cert uh, or SSL configuration, you can use the Nginx server configs. So they make it easy to incorporate all these best practices by default. So uh, a common best practice is far futures expires headers. So I don't want the browser to download JavaScript every single request. I want it to download JavaScript and have an expires header for 30 days from now, so it only downloads it once. They make it very easy to do this by default and give you a package Nginx configuration and a package Apache configuration so uh, that you have these best practices. It supports Apache, Nginx, and Lighty. And then Inc. Uh, the same people who make Zurb Foundation, uh, the company Zurb, uh, also makes Inc. If you need, have ever ha had to write email templates, I cannot recommend Inc. enough. It makes it extremely easy to write email templates that work across everywhere. Gmail, Outlook, everywhere. And that's very difficult for some reason. And then Analytics.js. So by, uh, oftentimes you have instrumentation that you need to write, whether you're using Google Analytics or Omniture or using something like Mixpanel or you're just pushing your own events into StatsD to pass them off to Carbon later. Um, Analytics.js makes it very easy to use one JavaScript library to track all your analytics solution. So it's not just you know, um, building modern applications, but it's testing them. It's using emails. It's actually uh, tracking instrumentation and then performance. Because in modern web applications, you really focus on performance because you understand that performance really impacts the user's experience. Users aren't really going to be successful unless they feel like they're, they're, the application's reactive. So if you take a look at most uh, web applications, by a show of hands, how many people have ever been in a checkout and you click the checkout button and it just goes slow and you really quickly start to lose faith in whether this is working or not? I think the engineer in all of us knows to just like wait it out so you don't get charged again. But oftentimes, people get very antsy, and they lose faith in the application. Is it working? Is it not working? There's no indicator that it's being successful. So there's been a bunch of studies around performance and how performance affects applications and user uh, perceived experience. And the idea here is that uh, 0.1 second or 100 milliseconds, it feels instantaneous. It feels like you're flipping a page in a book. One second allows you to think seamlessly. But after about three seconds, users start to abandon. And users who abandon are likely not to come back. So the idea here is that performance matters, and you should really focus on performance. And in modern web applications, the whole, all the tools that I've talked about, all the fr automating your front end workflows, is all about automating the tedious parts. And one of the tedious parts is packaging for production. So performance matters. And you should use some of these tools so that you optimize your applications for a great experience. So treat performance as a feature. 
Um, use the 14K rule so you have instant loading. So you want the browser to make a single request and get everything it needs to paint the page in under 14K. So if you've ever gone to Google and the page is always instant, no matter how crappy your connection is, it's because they follow this principle. The critical rendering path, um, basically standard 14K for the first request and then progressively load everything you need after. Um, yeah, so use responsive design and responsive images by default. You're building for a world where you have mobile devices, and on mobile devices you have Android, iPhone, you have tablets, you have different form factors, different devices, different platforms. If you're, tr if you're still building a mobile website and a real we like desktop website, you're doing it wrong. Your desktop, your website should be responsive regardless of the device. If you use some of the frameworks and the tools that I'm talking about, you don't have to put the work in to, to achieve that. If you use a responsive toolkit like Bootstrap and you follow their conventions, it'll be responsive out of the box. So it's gonna work across mobile, it's gonna work across desktop um, automatically without you having to do twice the effort. Um, and then use co good code, ma code management. So uh, I think most people in Spring World already are using versioning control and build automation, continuous integration, that sort of stuff. But the, use task runners to build and deploy production code. So we talked about Grunt and Gulp earlier. Um, you can do pretty much all the same things if you want in Maven. The same people who make uh, HTML5 boilerplate. So if you go to github.com slash h5bp, HTML5 boilerplate, they have an ant script that does all the things that the Grunt and Gulp scripts do, if that's your flavor. Um, it's not necessarily that you have to use these tools, but you should be doing these things either way. And then invest in performance. So Google has been uh, a great sponsor basically making the web faster and have invested heavily in performance engineering. They've released Google PageSpeed rules. The idea here is that you should test your applications to make sure that they're performant. Uh, if you go to developers.google.com slash PageSpeed, they make it very easy to check how performant your application is and they give you actionable advice on how to improve performance. And they have these based on the page speed rules. So the idea here is that they'll rate your, the performance of, your app, of the client side of your application on a scale of one to 100 based on these speed rules. So do you have uh, compression enabled? Are you using far features, caching headers? Are you using redirects excessively? Um, are you putting uh, blocking JavaScript in the page? So you should run your applications through this as part of your continuous integration setups. And it's really easy to do with the PageSpeed Insights NPM module. So just like everything else, I try to automate as much as possible. I only like to write this stuff once, and then I let it to, like, to, for, like it to be automated from that point forward. So NPM install PSI, and then you can run PSI as a command line tool just like Grunt or Gulp. You can integrate it into your continuous integration flow, or you can just run it manually from your dev environment. But it'll tell you what you're not doing. Like you're not compressing, you're caching, your, uh, you're not using compression, you're adding blocking JavaScript, uh, you're not ha you don't have optimized images, or hey, on this mobile size, you actually cl click on that button because the tap target's not big enough. A lot of things that you don't think about, um, Google's done a great job of automating that piece. And then finally, um, you know, today's best practices are tomorrow's anti-patterns. So the problem is, you know, HTTP1 has all these shortcomings, so people hacked around all of this. So you have domain sharding, you have concatenating all of your CSS and JavaScript. You have all these things that were built to hack around the shortcomings of HTTP1. But with Speedy and HTTP2 now, a lot of these things are gonna be anti-patterns because they've fixed that. So remember that the protocols are changing over time and it's in the same way that your uh, legacy jQuery JavaScript is, if you went to build the same app today, you'd do it completely different. Uh, it's the same way when you think about rewriting protocols. So HTTP2 uh, greatly improves things. You should unshard, you should unconcatenate, you should unsprite your images because it manages uh, HTTP connections much better. Um, and then you should really switch from inlining and polling to server push model. You have web sockets to make it very easy to push things to the browser. Um, and if you're really interested in this stuff, Ilya Grigoric has an awesome book on uh, high performance browser networking. It's available for free at hpbn.co slash HTTP2. And then finally, um, once you've built your application, you wanna test it across all your devices, you wanna see how it gets rendered. You can do this just to check performance, you can do this to check the quality assurance and understand that it's rendering correctly. Well, I'm a big fan of webpagetest.org. So webpagetest.org allows you to type in a URL, pick a device, pick a location, pick a network condition, and test it. So if I wanna see how every, if I wanna see how my application's being rendered from Sydney, Australia on a test, uh, Telstra connection, uh, on DSL, on Chrome, I can very quickly do that. And the best part is it's gonna show you a rendering video of the entire rendering process and a screenshot. 
Uh, and then they have an API so that you can automate all this as well. So if you really want to easily check across a, a different variety of browsers, um, and you want to check from a different set of locations over different network conditions, webpagetest.org makes it extremely easy to test your applications. And that is all I have for you. I think I went a little bit fast, but I'd like to open it up for any questions. Please. You know what, these are engineers we're talking about, the war will always rage. Um, I prefer SAS, I think it has the widest support and is the most powerful. But it's a personal preference, uh, you know, you can have people argue it the other way as well. SAS to me is where I think there's the, the most community support behind it, which means it'll probably last for the long term. Yeah, and I also like the inheritance, like it does think certain things just better and easier. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions? Um, I think Selenium's great, actually. So I mentioned Phantom JS, but uh, the, generally when you're going to do that, I use Selenium, Selenium and the Chrome Web Driver uh, to basically do a lot of the functional testing in the browser. Uh, fully support it, yeah. I think it's a, uh, what most people use to do real browser testing. Um, if you need a headless browser that you can run without actually setting up a full Selenium instance and Selen uh, installing all the browsers and configuring them, um, PhantomJS solves the problem pretty well. But yeah, Selenium is going to be the most powerful. It's also the most work to set up. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for joining. You can find all these slides at speakerdeck.com slash Dustin Whittle.